What's up guys and girls? Uh, today we're going to talk about a feature of SQL Server designed for high availability and disaster recovery called Always On Availability Groups. So this is a feature that was introduced in SQL Server 2012 and this allows you to cluster a set of nodes or replicas for the purposes of designing disaster recovery and failover into your system. So it's primarily set up of a set of primary and optional number of secondary databases hosted on SQL Server instances that are called replicas. So the primary replica handles all the rewrite operations. And what you can do with your secondary replicas is have them available as read only and even distribute load over to them. Or their other function is to be able to serve and take over as the primary in the event of a failure. And we're going to talk about how that's done. Before we dig in, I'd like to go over some of the key features and functions of always on availability groups. So of course, their primary responsibility is for high availability and they provide disaster recovery for your system. You can use it for minimizing downtime and patching and maintenance. So you can patch your replica servers uh, while you're serving traffic to your primary server, or you, and then you can fail over to those servers once they've been upgraded and then upgrade your uh, primary replica and then fall back. So it allows for a lot of flexibility and minimizing of that downtime. You can also use them for load balancing. So you can set up something called read-only routing where users can declare that they only want to read when they make their connection and then they could be routed to a secondary replica. So that allows you to distribute load across the servers and actually use your, your replicas in your system. You could have multiple replicas, as I said, an optional number. So you could have three, four, five replicas all uh, in your availability group and all getting replicated to. And this allows you to offload a lot of your heavy processing as well. So you can actually conduct backups and integrity checks from your replica nodes. And you also have the choice to replicate your data in synchronous or asynchronous commit fashion. So it's your choice and there's trade-offs for this. So you know, if you're operating in the same data center, then it's more realistic and feasible to use synchronous commit. But if you're operating over a wide area network, then you might want to look at asynchronous commit because you don't want to slow down your system because you've got to commit over a wide area network. And you've got flexible failover as well. So you can decide upfront whether you want failovers to be automatic, meaning that your failover cluster actually detects if your node is, in, is having uh, issues and could automatically fail over. So there's something called Quorum that is operating in the background and pinging the servers and trying to decide uh, on the health of your availability group. Or if you decide you'd rather do it yourself, you can do it manually. So it's all your choice. Some of the architectural features of availability groups. First of all, they're shared nothing, which means that all of the replicas have independent CPU, memory, and disk. So they're not sharing anything. We've got the uh, quorum, which, as I said before, this is what allows the availability group to decide the health of the, the, the replicas in the system. Uh, primarily, it's going to be pinging your primary and making sure that it's online and able to serve uh, the users of the, of the database. And if it detects something, it can be configured to do an automatic failover. And quorum can be configured to use node or node and disk majority. So you want to have an odd number. And that's why you have the option of adding a, basically what they call a uh, file share witness uh, in order to uh, break the tie. And you can have several replicas that are distributed over disparate locations. So you don't have to have every all the servers sitting in the same uh, data center or even in the same country. It could be geographically disparate. Um, of course, there are trade-offs to this because you do have to work, uh, work around latency when you've got uh, an availability group over a wide area network. But it can be very, and they can be very useful in migrations and disaster recovery implementations. So if you can, if you lost a data center due to some sort of, a, you know, let's say a hurricane or a tornado or something like that, but you had a uh, availability group that was distributed over multiple data centers, you could potentially fail over to that other system and have your business operations continue. And you can also use it for migrations. So uh, a good example of, uh, of how a project I was 
involved with used uh, availability groups was to migrate from a uh, data center that was uh, a co co-location into uh, AWS. And what we do end up doing was having our availability groups spanned across the data centers from the co-location co facility and into AWS. And then when it came time to flip the switch and migrate over, all we needed to do was fail over to the replica that was sitting in AWS. And we were able to, to do this all in minutes as opposed to you know doing a full backup and restore, which would have taken many hours to uh, basically fail or basically move over into and migrate into the new uh, AWS setup. And replicas and nodes can be added or removed to your availability after your availability group is created. So this is very useful. You know, if you decide that you no longer need as many replicas or you'd like to add a replica, you can always do that after the fact. And you can also have multiple availability groups on the same servers concurrently. So you can have uh, a set of data. And basically what availability group is, is a set of databases that you would like to work as a cohesive unit. And that allows you to group these and fail over things in groups. And maybe, maybe all the databases on a server don't belong in the same uh, cohesive group. And so you can group them independently. Some of the challenges that I've encountered with uh, availability groups. The first is if you're using TDA, TDE, um, you can't use the wizard to add databases to the availability group. So if, if you're not using TDE, you can actually go into a SQL Server Management Studio and then expand your availability group. And then there's a list of databases and then you can just click on the right click and add and you pick your database. As long as it meets the requirements, you can add it and it will, uh, SQL Server will add it to your availability group and do the backups and restores and uh, it's very easy, but if you're uh, using TDE, you can't do that. It's not available. So you have to run those commands and backups and restores uh, to, to get the database in the availability group. And if you're using TDE, you also have to make sure that the certificates used for TDE need to be installed on all the replicas. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to restore those databases. Now, another thing I've come across is that failures, you know, if you have some sort of uh, synchronization failure or something like that. It, it, SQL Server doesn't always give you all the information you need to do to diagnose and rectify in an expedient manner. And so I found in some cases, it's actually easier just to remove and re-add the database instead of actually fixing the underlying problem. Sometimes you can, you know, you can go in and maybe it's a, it's a problem with, uh, you know, the transaction log disk uh, has filled and you need to make sure that that gets cleaned up. And sometimes you can maybe shrink another uh, TRAN log from the database. It might be on the same disk, leave the space, and then get things uh, replicated again. But there's other cases where, you know, the, the errors that's being presented from SQL Server just isn't enough uh, for you to uh, fix the issue. And it's just sometimes easier to just remove and re-add the database. Uh, but that can be kind of painful depending on the size, you know. All of this... Uh, uh, all of the adding and removing of databases from the availability group, the time required is always going to be proportional to the size of the database because you got to do those backups and restores. So transaction log backups are very important. As I said, one of the issues that you've run into is like the, the log fills and it can't uh, replicate the transactions over the replicas. So you need to make sure that you've got those log backups running and uh, those log transaction logs are, are maintained and, and uh, they're not growing uh, without bound. Uh, Read-only routing is something that a lot of people often miss when they're setting up their availability groups. It's easy to miss, um, but it's uh, if you want to be able to utilize uh, your replicas in a read-only uh, fashion, uh, that's something that you need to have set up. And synchronization mode needs to be considered uh, for the underlying network. So uh, if you are operating your availability group over a wide area network, hey, you probably want to be using asynchronous mode just so you're not slowing down your primary system. Uh, when transactions are getting committed. Pictures are always good to solidify an idea. So here's a simple diagram of a SQL Server always on availability group. So what you've got are nodes that are participating in the availability group. They are contained in a Windows failover cluster. You can have, you're going to have at least two nodes, maybe more nodes. Uh, in this case, this AZ, this stands for availability zone. So you've got node one operating 
in one availability zone, let's say that's in New York, and you've got node two that's in another availability zone, let's call that Chicago. Um, and then we've got a witness, this is what we're using for quorum, and that's in a third availability zone, let's say that's in Dallas, Texas. And so we've got a distributed network here, um, of, and this is probably set up for more of a disaster recovery scenario. We've got our availability group in which we've got databases that are resident on the nodes that are in the availability group. And so let's say that this is our primary server node one. And so when someone connects to the AG, they will be routed to node one. Let's say that they're trying to do read and write transactions, they would be routed here. And if they declared that they wanted to do read only uh, usage of the database of DB1, and they had their read intent set up and they've got read only routing set up in their listener, well then they may be routed over to DB1 on node two to do the work that they're trying to do. And then we've got our witness that is basically you being used with Quorum to determine the health of these two nodes and the availability group could be configured to fail over from node one to node two if it detects that there's some kind of unhealthiness going on with respect to the uh, availability group and the ability for node one to service the transactions. Just a few points on monitoring. So there is a uh, AG dashboard uh, integrated into SQL Server Management Studio. So it's invaluable in monitoring the health of your availability group. So you pull that up and you can look at each database and it's got color coded health, you know, green is healthy, amber is a potential problem and red is, you know, serious problem. This database is not replicated. Um, there are tools available for tracking synchronization status. Uh, you can use like, you know, all the various monitoring tools have, uh, have uh, add-ons that basically check the health of the availability group and report that to you. You can also develop your scripts on your own to query and uh, report discrepancies. You can query the DMVs and see uh, what the health is and what the lag of, and latency that there might be in your availability group and, and just have thresholds and report on that. Also, you know, use, you know, check your SQL server logs. It's going to have events in there that talk about what's going on uh, in the availability group, tell you about things uh, like uh, failovers are occurring, or if there's some kind of problem with uh, synchronization, you might find that in your SQL server logs. And failover cluster manager also has a very, you know, very useful log information about the health of the Windows failover cluster. And that'll do it for today's video. I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, I threw a lot at you. So if you have any questions, hey, we can dig into particular topics about uh, SQL Server availability groups. Um, I can gladly put together a video to dig into something that you want a little bit of info on. So drop it in the comments below. And if you uh, learned something, please like the video. And I hope you guys consider subscribing. So I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.